Hello, everybody. Welcome to CDA Expo Virtual. The topic we're here to discuss is exploring resimmersial opportunities. I'm Tom LeBlanc. I'm the Director of Industry Outreach for NSCA, National Systems Contractors Association. Some of you guys in the audience might recognize me. I, I worked for CPRO years and years and years ago. And one of the things I did at CPRO was write about the light commercial market. Back then, our concept of the light commercial market was residential guys might want to diversify a little bit into some commercial uh, projects that make sense for them and diversify and, and get revenue by the commercial market. And it's still going strong and taking on a new life as we're talking about it here in 2020. So a uh, special thank you before we get started to Samsung, uh, our sponsor for today's session. So thank you to Samsung. Um, and I also want to introduce you to our great panel. So Aaron Cowden, he's the CEO and founder of Fusion Audio and Video. Aaron, can you talk to us a little bit about you know, your company's experience in the, in the residential and commercial market? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Tom. Um, so we started out about 17 years ago um, and uh, started out as like probably many in the industry as primarily a, a residential firm. Um, and we didn't really start dabbling in commercial till about 2008. Um, and quite honestly, that's probably part of the reason we made it through 08 and 09 is that we had some diversification in our business um, as residential dipped off pretty heavily. Uh, we were able to rely on some of the commercial projects that we'd started working on. Um, but until uh, about seven or eight years ago, we really didn't put a quality focus on commercial. Um, and what changed um, about seven years ago was that we started to have a focus team that worked solely on commercial, um, i.e. a leadership team uh, that was focused on uh, that vertical and uh, started building a sales team that could focus on um, reaching out to those clients. Um, today, uh, we've moved from 100% commercial uh, a residential to where we are now with uh, about a 60-40 mix, 60% 60, 60 residential and 40% and commercial. Yeah, and I'm going to be going to quite a few times, Aaron, because that's that's sort of a su success story in this resumercial world. You know, a lot of companies are interested in, they know there are revenue opportunities out there in the commercial market, but they don't know quite how to do it. So we're going to be going to you quite a few times. By the way, CPRO research shows that 42% of integrators revenue, and you know that survey is going to residential integrators or traditional residential integrators. They're saying 42% of integrators' revenue from last year came from commercial projects. So that's really significant. Okay, so moving along with the panel, I want to introduce David Phelps, Director of Smart Signage Product Marketing for Samsung. Hey, David, welcome. And tell us a little bit about you know, Samsung's kind of view of this market. Hey, Tom, thanks for having me. And uh, I'm, I'm privileged to be here and take a few minutes to talk about some of not only our products, but also our strategy. So Samsung is very uh, focused on using a, a broad portfolio of TV and display signage products uh, to take a strong position in the resumercial space. If any of you would have worked with Samsung before, we all know it's a huge company, but there's often times we find pockets of, of business where we're not super strong. In the last 18 months, we've made a, a very aggressive investment specifically into the resumercial space, which includes launching products that make selling, installation, and the overall experience much easier for our integrator partners. So whether someone's looking for a single outdoor display, whether that's poolside or at a small or medium business, or a series of products spread around a specific location, our main goal is to make sure we offer something for everyone in this space. That's great, David. So we'll get a chance to get a manufacturer's point of view and an integrator's point of view on this, which is you know, great. It's great to get those two perceptions into the conversation. So before we get started, a couple of housekeeping notes to keep in mind. At the bottom of the screen, you'll see a chat function and a Q&A function. Please make sure to put your questions into the Q&A function, and we'll do our best to answer any questions at the end of the session. So thank you for that. Um, all right. So I thought a good way to kind of kick off the conversation would be, let's try to understand what we mean by resumercial, right? 
So I think there are a few different definitions. And I'm gonna throw out one definition and then we'll kind of talk about it. So a light commercial application performed by a residential custom integration company, that's residential. An example would be like bars, restaurants, small retail, corporate boardrooms on a small scale. Um, and those applications can include audio, video, security, energy management, control. So Aaron, you're the one who's out there doing it. Can you give me some examples of the types of light commercial projects your company actually works on? So restaurants is probably uh, the most common one that comes to mind. Um, but we have really found that with restaurants, it can, it can be quite hit or miss. Um, it's such a low margin uh, industry. Um, and with all the challenges they're facing right now, even more. Uh, so we found uh, that restaurants, uh, what really makes sense there is, is going after um, more of the established chains and trying to get with the leadership um, that are willing to invest in quality technology solutions because we don't want to compete with uh, the two guys in a truck or um, the Costco's of the world. Um, which is what you run, which is what you run into often uh, when you meet with some restaurants, in that um, they are looking for the cheapest solutions possible just to get technology. Um, so you can be successful in the restaurant space, um, but you you have to be focused and willing to say no to the wrong project. Um, where we've really found success, I would say, would be in the common area amenities, um, apartments, uh, condo developments small conference rooms for small businesses, uh, building security, uh, gyms, uh, community pools. Um, those are all applications that oftentimes the larger commercial firms uh, aren't willing to give the service that those clients need, um, which gives us a, um, a void to fill where we can really be successful and, and show the same personal service we offer on the residential side um, to some of these commercial clients. So, so MDU, that's kind of like the marriage, right, between residential and commercial because, you know, a multi-dwelling unit is residential, but there are those common spaces that kind of fall into that commercial category. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Um, MDU uh, is one of those tricky ones. We, we, haven't, uh, we haven't really solved the challenge of, of how you uh, work with the individ individual units uh, in the MDUs. We're working on packages and approaches that can help us reach um, those tenants that move into the MDUs. But where we found the success in the MDU pro projects is with the common area amenities. Um, all of these developers um, and these project managers are looking for a way to set themselves apart um, from the other um, properties nearby. Uh, so when you're talking to um, a developer, it's really important to be ready to be creative, be a problem solver. Um, don't go in just asking what do they want, but uh, be ready to present fresh ideas, um, how they can make better, better social areas, uh, better media access for their tenants, um, common area amenities. Uh, we've done things like sports simulators. Um, we're even seeing the emergence of, uh, of some VR uh, huddle spaces. Uh, there, there's a lot of opportunities for us to think out of the side, outside of the box and um, come up with some cool ideas that, you know, sometimes we would love to implement, but I haven't had an opportunity to, but could really set one property apart uh, from the other. Now, you know, David, I'm really interested in your perspective. You know, Samsung, you know, as we've discussed, it's a large company and it's a very strategic company. So when it analyzes a market and focuses on a market, there's probably good reason for that, right? So I'm interested, like, when Samsung expresses interest in this residential market, what are some aspects of it or some areas of it that are of particular interest? Yeah, so it... it funny you mention it that way because we don't do much at Samsung in terms of launching products without a lot of data and a lot of backup to justify the R&D and the cost expenditures that go into uh, launching these new products. So about five years, quick little history, about five years ago, Resimercial represented less than 5% of our total business. Obviously, Samsung TVs, 
uh, uh, traditional commercial displays. There's, they've had established channels to go sell this product. And again, five years ago, you know, we the, the residential space wasn't really on the radar. That is now ticked up to almost, or a little over 15%, I should say. So pretty rapid growth. And I think a lot of that is based on some of the things Aaron was saying, out of the box thinking with how you can use displays uh, in different uh, atmospheres, whether that's home or like he said, at the community pool. Uh, the way you know we're most focused on driving this segment is from a product perspective though. Previously, uh, beyond uh, the last two to three years, we just didn't have the right product for someone to go out and, and meet the solution needs that they had. So because of these new technologies, we're really hoping this allows the resident, the typical residential custom integrator to sell a full solution from a single brand, obviously, based on the sponsorship today and by being on this panel, I hope that brand is Samsung, but you know, many other brands could fill the void as well. Uh, when, we, when I look at my commercial lineup, there's two products that we're most focused on right now. The first is the Samsung Pro TV. This is a product that launched this year uh, and it's, really made to be an, a somewhat simple solution uh, for a small, medium business to showcase the things that they want, like a menu overlay while the game is still playing. As we've seen with the business environment this year, both homes and uh, businesses have had to rethink their display strategy. A standard menu uh, on the table, if you've done any of the outdoor dining that we're doing here in the Northeast, is not necessarily the right option anymore. So screen overlays with menus or you know, very small screen commercial displays, 13 inch that could be quickly cleaned and reused are the types of solutions that we're seeing that we have not seen in the past. I think importantly for today's, uh, for the panel today, we're also always willing and interested in feedback directly from the people that are doing the work. So. Like if an installer has a good idea, we have ways to get that back to myself and my team. And then we can share that with our headquarters uh, partners who do all of the R&D. We don't have a true one size fits all product, but we do have the ability to launch many different products that fit a wide variety of needs. So, you know, one of those products that Samsung provides, you know, you guys do a lot of um, video displays. That goes without saying. Um, and I had um, I had mentioned that we're going to give some examples of you know residential definitions and a, another definition that I wanted to throw out there and we touched upon it a little bit before when, in our chat with Aaron, but um, MDUs is a big you know a big way that a lot of folks identify with that residential world. So let's talk about that. A large scale multi dwelling unit, M multi dwelling unit MDU residential structure that's managed like a commercial project, even though its ultimate use is, is really residential. So an MDU would include equipment and in common public areas that is usually applied to commercial projects. You know, these could be like intercoms, as, a, access control, surveillance solutions, and video walls. And, you know, if we could put up that image that, um, that Aaron, Aaron had shared with us of uh, an MDU lobby example, you know, video walls can play a, a very significant role in, in these areas. They're not just for entertainment, they're for, you know, providing messaging, you know, for to tenants and, and that sort of thing. Also providing emergency information and important security information, that sort of thing. Aaron, do you, do you want to talk a little bit more about MDUs in terms of how you see um, technology being used in these common spaces? Yeah, so a, a lot of the common areas, um, first of all, they're, uh, they're built around uh, video and, and audio. Um, but uh, to David's point, messaging is becoming really important. Um, so uh, that's, we were really excited to see some of the um, seamless integration that's coming out with some of the new Samsung Pro panels. Um, the fact that we no longer have to pair a third party um, digital player to deliver um, to deliver the messaging and it can actually be integrated into the into the set and overlaid over what you're watching so that's really really powerful um, also the uh, the ability for um, users to 
interact with the technology. Um, some of the technologies that are integrated that allow things um, like uh, video screen sharing um, um, and web conferencing, video conferencing, which obviously is just becoming huge right now. Uh, all, all of those features in these common areas become, become really important. So, you know, David, you know, with video walls, video walls is kind of interesting, right? If you're a residential company that's diversifying into commercial space, one of the things that you're not necessarily comfortable installing or have a lot of experience installing in your customers' homes is a video wall, but video walls play a big role in commercial spaces, including MDUs. Do you think that there's a big learning curve for a residential integrator transitioning to the point where they need to be, you know, responsible for those video walls? So this is a, uh, a a pretty honest answer, but the uh, the best I can come up with is kind of. So we have highly recommended steps uh, in place in order to make sure that the product isn't damaged or compromised during the installation. I think that's one of the biggest things that people need to factor in when you're talking about a, a video wall, on really of any size, <clears throat> excuse me, but especially a larger video wall. They have to be very carefully handled, usually multiple people, uh, because you know one bad panel could could spoil the whole installation process, and, and we don't want to put you know our partners joining here on the on the call today in that type of position. So it starts with transporting the products, like I said, multiple people, and you can't. There are certain ways to set the product on the floor so that the cabinet is not damaged, which could also cause problems. Uh, when you're actually talking about the install itself, and many of you may know much of what I'm saying right now, but there needs to be a specific gap maintained between each of the panels. If this is compromised, you could have issues with color distortion or potentially cracking the screen. Uh, all of this, all of the guidance on this is on Samsung.com in our case or in the in the manual. Yeah. And then lastly, not to keep you know building on it, but there's also color calibration, which could require an additional skill set. But with all that being said, and this isn't much different than a lot of things in life. After you've done a few, we found, and I specifically, you know, reached out to some of our internal tech experts on this because, uh, you know, I'm not the one generally doing this type of stuff. I'm more on the business side. But they've said, I don't want to say it's like riding a bike, but after a few installs, you're in a position where you, you really do know what you're doing. And the actual hooking up and that type of stuff, once you've got everything in place, is really not that difficult. So my answer is not great because it's kind of, but I think, you know, not not long into the process, it becomes a, it becomes a relatively simple install for the for the type of people that are joining us today. Okay. Yeah. Like like, yeah, the, like Legos. Yeah, very complicated Legos. Maybe like Legos for an eight year old, not a four year old. Go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, I was going to add to that. the The complexity is is more the not knowing what you don't know. You know, I, I remember when when we hadn't done a video wall yet and it was one of those things. It's like, ah, oh, really? Those are so cool. I'd love to do one. And we got our first one. Um, and it wasn't nearly as complex as we thought. Yes, there's you have to take your time with it. Um, there's a lot of new details to learn. Um, I, I'd say one of the things we learned early on is it, it doesn't make sense to try to cut any corners when it comes to the mounting. Uh, there are there are mount companies that specialize in making amazing mounting solutions to work with video walls that allow micro adjustments to get these things to look perfect. That's one of the hardest parts is getting them mounted properly. Um, so uh, those those little devils in the details, um, they're all things you can learn along the way. Um, and and we love reaching out to our fellow integrators when we're doing something we've never done before. I mean, the manufacturer is one resource, but uh, there are so many great guys in our industry that are just willing to help. Um, you know, us, for example, we're in, we're in the pro source buying group and, and I've got probably 30 guys that um, I reach out to via text or email um, when we're, uh, we're meeting a new challenge and just ask them, Hey, what are the things I need to look out for? Because most of the stuff we're doing uh, has been done before. So there's really no, uh, there's no, really no reason to go in flying blind, you know, be, be willing to ask for help and, and ask the right questions leading into it. That's right. Tom, if I could add one more note, the, I think if, if we're having this discussion 
maybe next year if people like us enough or two years from now. I think the question is really going to be more geared towards LED. We're seeing, a, we are seeing people begin to transition from video wall to LED. And that installation, I think, is significantly more difficult than, than video wall, just to, just to throw that out there. But from a market perspective, you know, as a manufacturer, we're constantly studying trends. We are, we are starting to slowly, albeit, but we are starting to see a shift from video wall to very large screen uh, LED. That could be in someone's home with our the wall product or, you know, really, really big rollouts like the new ramp and charger stadium in LA. So just from a market perspective, I just want to make sure everybody's aware of that because uh, we, we could be having a different conversation in a, in a year or two. Yeah, and it's almost like you can't over describe um, how omnipresent video walls and the emergence of LED is going to be. I mean, it's like customers are finding applications that didn't exist before and needs for video walls and any kind of large scale video display. So, you know, difficult or not difficult, it's something that's going to be really important for integrators, both residential and commercial going forward. Um, let me do another definition. This will be my last definition of the residential market. And this is one that's kind of taken on a new life um, as we all kind of navigate through the pandemic and, and, and how life has changed. But all right, here's a definition of residential. A residential application of enterprise grade equipment, such as a robust home network, high end home recording studio, home office with high end teleconferencing and unified communications and collaboration equipment, UCC. Um, so that's obviously taken on sort of a different meeting, meaning over the last several months as a lot of companies are, have a lot more remote employees and a lot of residential customers are probably working from home, whereas they hadn't before. You know, David, with so many people working from home these days, what, how does Samsung see this opportunity? So it's very interesting because, as I mentioned before, being such a big company, my specific role is focused on commercial displays. So I have to answer this question a few ways. From a consumer standpoint, both um, not only with uh, just traditional TVs, but computer monitors, uh, home appliances, we've seen since you know early March when a lot of people started heading home through last week, just explosive sales. The argument being people are home, they're, in, you know, they're saving money on gas and, you know, I live in New Jersey, so there's no tolls. There's a lot of, in many cases, extra disposable income to reinvest in your home. The, the, the amount of time we've spent at home is also much longer than, you know, I sort of anticipated when, when we were first sent home, which I thought was going to be a few weeks. When you look at this actual investment into working from home on the commercial side it's actually been less than what we anticipate what i anticipated and what i kind of built into my you know full year forecast or like my numbers estimate i anticipated lots of people uh investing in work from home collaboration solution solutions like our flip interactive whiteboard uh in many cases if, if you have a true home office we, we anticipated people buying a large format display for, the wall, for their wall to really try to recreate what they have in the office. We, uh, took some of, um, we took some time to build what we were considering an executive home office bundle. So if you were to buy you know, a, third, a, a large curve, say a 34, 37 inch curve monitor, an interactive whiteboard, and an LSD uh, with video conferencing solution built in, uh, we, you know, bundle all those together and sell and, and sell them as a package so someone could truly be working from home but feel like they're in the boardroom in their office. And we frankly just have not seen that uptick. So I think the investment has really gone into the computer monitor business and then the other things, uh, you know, more the family pieces like upgrading the living room TV or putting one of our Terrace Pro uh, TVs outside. Um, so it hasn't, we haven't really benefited from it myself specifically, but Samsung as a whole, and I think if you look at market data, most manufacturers, there's been a huge uptick in the investment into the home and those specific products. 
Yeah, and thanks, David. It's really interesting. You know, Aaron, I think if you look at it on the surface, it seems like this is an enormous opportunity for residential integrators, but it doesn't actually play out like that all the time, right? Like it's not for everybody to, you know, kind of work on those robust home office environments, is it? Yeah, we uh, we initially tried to uh, really build some solutions and, and market to this opportunity. We thought the same thing, that there would be a huge demand. Um, but what we found was uh, it wasn't going to be an enterprise grade equipment at home, um, specifically when you're talking about high end teleconferencing, unified communications and collaboration equipment. Uh, we've seen almost no movement there. Uh, and I think part of that is driven by consumer expectations, uh, you know, with the plethora of IOT solutions out there for low, uh, low margin home video options. You know, you got your, your Google hubs, your portal by Facebook, your looms, your Logitechs. Um, the general consumer thinks, uh, they should be able to spend a couple hundred dollars and solve this. I mean, it, it just look at the way we're, um, hosting uh, this call, this video call right now, most of us are probably on the camera on our laptop or a small $99 camera. Um, so we didn't see that investment, even though there were great solutions from Samsung. Uh, Crestron came out with a, uh, an interesting offering um, for the home use, uh, Clear One. And um, we tried to market these and, and really even our highest net worth clients, what they ended up doing was investing more, to David's point, um, in their computer monitor, and maybe they bought a nice camera and a nice microphone. Uh, but there are opportunities, um, and those opportunities um, we've seen have been in actually to the improvement of the traditional residential products, um, selling terrace TVs outdoors, um, expanding uh, your, your backyard audio system with a, a landscape audio system. Um, people are looking for more ways to, to enjoy their time at home because they're spending more time at home. Um, and, and another unique uh, segment we're, we've been growing is uh, home health, um, you know, air filtration and uh, controlling light and, and things like that. But uh, really, we, we, we haven't seen that trickle down of the enterprise grade equipment. Um, the one piece, the one uh, segment that I would say is different would be in networking. We are selling a significant amount more of, uh, of commercial grade networks. So, I mean, this is definitely part of the resumercial conversation, but, um, you know, for us, you know, we, we, we can't dive too deep into the home, home office technology realm, but folks in the audience who do want to learn a little bit more about, you know, that opportunity for residential integrators, you know, kind of diving into that home office opportunity. There's another CD Expo virtual session that I think has taken place today at 3 p.m. Eastern time called the Rise of the Home Office Tech Talk. So you might want to check that out, add it to your schedule. Um, but all right, so moving along with this conversation, you know, Aaron, we can talk about this, you know, we can talk about how it's logical and we can talk about how residential integration companies can do it if they want to, they can diversify into these commercial spaces. But let's talk a little bit about, you know, about whether or not it, it makes sense from a business standpoint. And for you guys, and you described a little bit of this at the beginning, it's had a tremendous business impact on your company. That diversification has been really important for, you know, sort of the, the course that your company took. Can you talk a little bit about that business impact? Yeah, so the diversification has been huge for us uh, as the, the residential and commercial markets uh, ebb and flow individually. Um, and uh, our, we, we allow our tech teams to be shared uh, between both sides of the business. While um, techs have a focus, um, they are primarily commercial or primarily residential. Um, they work on both of those type of projects. So you have an opportunity to keep your, to keep your team busy. Um, as things change. Uh, also, uh, building relationships. Um, many of our residential customers, well, majority of residential customers work somewhere. They own a business um, and they need these solutions. Um, so there's, there's a low hanging fruit there where you have an opportunity with someone that you've already built um, trust with. Uh, and on the commercial side, it, it, light commercial is interesting because 
these businesses grow. And as they grow, it gives you an opportunity to grow with them. Uh, we've had some fantastic small businesses grow into medium-sized businesses where now we're doing much larger facilities and we're learning about things like video walls and other technologies that we otherwise wouldn't have been exposed to. Yeah. And yeah, I want to, all right. So we can talk about all the positive stuff and you know, the, the positive impact and it's great for residential integration companies to get excited about diversifying into the commercial market. But you being a guy who works for a company that's kind of lived through this, you can look back on the success and you know you you can recognize that there were probably some obstacles that a typical residential integration company might not anticipate there are differences between the two markets can you talk a little bit about some stuff that you know if you're a residential integration company and you you start to diversify there are some things that might surprise you about the market can you talk a little bit about that well, I think the timing uh, expectation is unique. Uh, businesses are moving in when they're moving in and they need their systems operational. Um, and like most of our projects, um, you know, commercial or residential, uh, there, there's often a certain amount of chaos around the finish of a, of a job. Um, so having to uh, adhere to those strict schedules on the um, on the commercial side uh, can be tough. Um, also, the um, the product overlap. Uh, trying to figure out when you really need a commercial solution versus when you need a res residential solution. Um, you know, you don't always need a commercial display. Sometimes a residential display uh, will suffice, um, but you have to pay attention to things like the manufacturer's warranty. Uh, many manufacturers won't cover things if installed in a commercial environment in a 24-7, 365 uh, application. Uh, there's also the, uh, the legal side. Um, you're going to have to carry different levels of insurance, different levels of coverage. Uh, you may be required by businesses to um, look at certain licensing and bonding and certifications. So those are certainly some unique challenges we've hit. Uh, I, I remember early on when we were we were going after certain projects against the big guys, and uh, they said, "Well, well, sorry, you don't hold this certification, um, or um, you're going to need uh, five million dollars of insurance." Um, a few other things um, that that come to mind would be that uh, when you're dealing with a commercial customer. You're not dealing with someone typically uh, that has a passion that's necessarily spending their own money. They're typically dealing with a budget um, and they're trying to solve a problem. Um, on the residential side, uh, clients, uh, typically what they're buying is a luxury, not a necessity. Um, on the commercial side, uh, the purchases are something that are critical to uh, their business needs. Um, and they need you to solve a, pro a specific problem that they've been asked um, by their leadership team to, to solve. Yeah, and uh, there has to be a difference, right? You know, between a salesperson who's in a position to sell something to a homeowner that's going to improve their, their home and you know, their family environment and a salesperson's experience that's selling to you know, somebody who in a company environment, you know, maybe they're a facilities manager or an IT manager or something like that. They're involved in, you know, purchases related to technology and facilities for their organization. That's just a different type of conversation. And, you know, you mentioned earlier, you, you talked about splitting up, um, you know, coming up with a commercial division and a residential division. Is that, is, in your experience, is that an important thing to do? And is it important for the salespeople to either be different salespeople or trained completely differently for the two markets? Well, starting out, um, anytime we start a new um, initiative in our company, uh, we, we like to first start by researching and second by uh, what I would call dabbling. Um, so get your feet wet. Um, start to work on um, some small light commercial projects. Um, but as you develop a business plan for going after uh, that side, um, 
of the audio video world. Uh, I, I would say that it, it is really important to have people that are focused differently um, on these solutions. Um, once you reach a, uh, a, a certain critical mass, um, the, the salesperson that knows how to meet with business owners, knows how to engage facility managers, project managers, GCs, um, it's a different conversation, a much different conversation. The home projects are a passion project and the commercial projects are, are you solving a problem, bringing a solution, uh, definitely less emotion in the sales experience uh, on the commercial side than there is on the residential side. And then the, the other thing I would ask, you know, related to that is there could sometimes be different hours involved, right? Um, you know, when it's appropriate to work on a residential environment could differ from when it's appropriate to work in a commercial environment, depending on the type of business it is. And that's another reason to consider, you know, like having a, sec a separate technical staff that can work different shifts and, you know, cater to those commercial customers. Is that something that you guys kind of toyed with? Um, we do that on a on a case by case basis. There there are some opportunities where we're trying to wrap up a commercial project, and uh, it's okay for us to be there nights and weekends. Um, I'd say one thing that residential guys uh, will love about commercial um, is most commercial projects um, outside of maybe restaurants. Um, when you're working on a local level, uh, they're not going to call you after business hours. Uh, and that's completely different on the residential side. Uh, there's probably a lot of people on this uh, call that uh, get those calls at you know 10 o'clock on a Saturday or 2 o'clock on a Sunday when they're with their family from a, a person at their house that's trying to watch the big game. Uh, well, that just doesn't happen on the commercial side, uh, really, ex except for restaurants. Uh, they, have, they have nine to five critical solutions. They need their conference rooms and their boardrooms to work during business hours. Um, outside of that, you, you rarely get phone calls um, after hours on the commercial side. So it, it, that, that's a nice benefit. Um, and the diversification piece you mentioned where you can work in those facilities after hours is, is nice when you need the uh, extra bandwidth. Yeah. All right. So Aaron and David, I think you'll agree. This has already been a really good discussion and we've given, you know, folks in the audience a lot to ask us about. So now let's move to the Q and a portion of the session. All right. We are back. Um, we did get some excellent questions. Um, you know, Aaron, I'm going to start off with you. You know, one question was, you know, based on our conversation about how effective it can be to diversify and how, you know, tapping into that residential market can, you know, it can basically, you know, provide the company with some insurance and support when going through rough times. So the question was to put it in the context of what everyone's going through right now, the whole COVID pandemic. What has that been like? Uh, how has it played out for you with the commercial resi mix? Well, commercial has been significantly down. Um, so actually, it's been the reverse this time around. I would say that resi is up um, and commercial is down. And, and what we've seen is uh, less cancellations of commercial projects and more delays of commercial projects. So in June, July, um, commercial was really, really slow, um, mostly with the customers saying, um, you know, our budgets are frozen right now. Um, now into August and September, we're seeing those projects come back and they're actually roaring back. Uh, there's a lot of new projects in the commercial space uh, where these facility managers are reaching out and trying to adjust their facilities for what the new normal may be for whatever their company's policies are, are gonna be moving forward. Mm -hmm. David, have, have, from Samsung's perspective, have you guys seen you know, any sort of a, a bump or decline in either market that's worth commenting on? Yeah, I mean, we have seen a, a pretty significant decline in where we projected our commercial business to be this year. Uh, interestingly, that's gone from some of our biggest partners all the way down to some of our smallest. So it's re it's really been across the board. I have presented a few times internally in the last couple of weeks that I've started to see a change. We have 
opportunities starting to come in a lot more than they were so in May, June specifically, actually April as well, a little earlier. Uh, so we're, we're starting to see that kind of turn a little bit slowly, not, not as fast as I would like. But I know our retail side, as I mentioned before, has, has just thrived throughout, throughout all of this with people investing more in their homes. Yeah. And so, so guys, a lot of the questions that I've seen come in relate to specifically, you know, like in these commercial environments, what is being installed? Because when you think about it, you know, if you're a traditional residential installer, that's one of the, the big differences in the market is getting familiar with the types of solutions that might be needed in a commercial environment. So Aaron, I'm going to hit you up with a whole bunch of questions. Ready? All right. So, <laughs> so in the MDU market, you know, like the way we kind of described it before we were talking about like video walls and, you know, we were kind of describing like a, like a really nice AV environment in a lobby. Um, but there are other elements of an MDU project that don't reflect, you know, really nice AV, you know, the, not like the home theater type environment. Can you talk about some of the, the elements that are needed in these types of multi-dwelling unit environments that, you know, maybe a traditional resi integrator might not be familiar with? Well, access control uh, is a big one. Uh, in, in a lot of markets, there's, there's not good representation um, around um, uh, more current access control solutions, cloud-based access control solutions. Security uh, um, and cameras are, are certainly important. Um, less flashy, but um, they're needed on all of these all of these types of installations. Um, and then cabling, we stay we stay away from uh, large cabling projects on MDUs, but there is opportunity there for guys who specialize in that. You know, David. You know, you'd mentioned LEDs earlier, and you know the the upcoming you know, proliferation of LEDs that's probably going to happen in the future very soon. But digital signage, you know, digital signage is a big deal in, in almost every commercial environment nowadays. And, and that's another thing that if you're a traditional residential integrator, you might not be familiar with, you know, how to approach that and also how to sell it. You know, perhaps there's a recurring revenue service contract related model that goes on the back end of a digital signage project. Um, any thoughts about, you know, how digital signage plays into all of this? Yeah, well, I think it, it starts with, there's such a, not only from Samsung, but from our competitors as well, there's such a wide range of products. So it's really kind of, you can cater something specifically to your needs. Uh, throughout the last, you know, four months, we've seen a lot of our more simple solutions that have done well. So you can see people migrating over to digital not necessarily making the biggest investment uh, out there, but getting sim, for example, our pro TV products has become very, very popular throughout this time period. Not only because there's a more simple solution, but you can also, you know, as I mentioned before, overlay content. You're not bringing in this robust software solution. Ideally, I think we'll get back to a situation where it's true digital signage that's selling again. Uh, for Samsung, that means Magic Info. Our competitors all have similar software uh, uh, solutions, and that'll be to kind of to the the reoccurring revenue point that you brought up before. Okay. Um, so, Aaron, you know, another question that came in was really kind of interesting, and you know, from my standpoint at NSCA, I'm seeing where this question is coming from. You know, the question is basically, are new commercial jobs smaller now? Well it would make sense if they were, right? Because, you know, in office environments, everybody's sort of um, uh, changing their approach to what their uh, office environment, their workspace is gonna be like. Um, they might not be, you know, looking to uh, install giant conference rooms like they did before, but yet, it, yet they might also not wanna be installing small huddle rooms, which would require people to be cramped into small spaces. So the question is really, you know, like, are you seeing commercial projects change as a result of all this? Yeah, it's um, it's more a, it's more a shift of what we're selling as opposed to selling less. Um, they're investing more in the, uh, the like for example, a project we have running right now. Uh, the the leaders of the company, the CEOs and the executive teams, they're investing a lot more in those enterprise grade. Uh, 
teleconferencing, teleconferencing solutions that we were talking about earlier. Um, we're seeing a lot of those projects come in, whereas before they were willing to, to handle their um, video conferencing in this kind of format with just a, a basic camera. Um, so yes, the huddle spaces have an opportunity to maybe uh, dwindle a little bit. Um, the individual workspaces, I think, are being improved, uh, approved upon a lot. Okay. All right. So David, I'm not a specs guy and I don't know the, the product SKUs like, uh, like you do. So you're going to have to translate this question for me. Um, you, you have the, the pro TV is a 16, uh, 17 or 16 by 17, but do you have it as a 24 or seven? No. So that's referring to the hours that the, the panel usage or the hours grade on the T on the display. So right now the plan is for 16, seven only. We have seen a few other, uh, in a few other formats, the question be asked about 24 by seven. So the best I can do is share that with our, with our um, R and D people at our headquarters in Korea and we, and make a business case for why we need it. But as of now, uh, that's just the 16 by seven option for us. I did want to jump back to the previous question as you know, it's, it's still very unknown what the new corporate environment is going to look like. Most people have been home for six months, but, We've started to see some of the um, discussions, you, you know, that were taking place in January and February start to reemerge for us. And one thing we've seen in huddle spaces is requests for larger screen sizes. So 85 inch and 98 inch for us, which is, you know, a pretty small portion of our business. We're trying to ramp up production of those as huddle spaces move from uh, potentially what, what were very small little cutouts within an office building into bigger spaces that will require a larger screen. So that's just one sort of new emerging trend that we've seen in the last probably 45 days. I think huddle spaces are always gonna be critical, uh, but especially as we start to get back to the office for the, you know, this learning period we're all gonna go through, uh, a lot of companies are thinking bigger screen, spread the people out a little more, but still have the functionality of the brainstorming and, and what, you know, the, the types of things that have gone on in huddle spaces previously. Okay. Well, well, first of all, I want to thank David and Aaron for doing a great job on this um, session. And, and just a final thought for me, you know, one thing, you know, we know about the integration business is it's so important to diversify. And, you know, the last few months, unfortunately, have taught us that um, in, in a really harsh way. So, you know, exploring this resimercial market, I think is really valuable for residential integrators and and learning all you can to find out if your company can be successful in this pace, case, because that is not always going to be the case, right? In some cases, you might, you might decide that it's not the right move for you, but exploring the market and finding out in general the best ways for your company to diversify, we think are really important. So again, you know, thanks very much to David and Aaron, and thanks to our sponsor, Samsung, and uh, thanks to everybody in the audience for joining us today. We hope you have a great CDS show.